is Mark Belton, Super Training Gym. Super Training Gym, the strongest gym in the West. We're here at the 2017 Arnold Classic with Matt Wenning. Oh my God. <laughs> so before we dive into science-y type stuff and, and uh, some of the type of training that Matt does, let's just talk a little bit about the business side. Matt has recently, uh, well not recently, over the last several years been working with police, firemen, military. How did some of that come to be? I think it's just following what you do, you know, like initially um, writing articles in your magazine and then writing articles that got published in Muscle and Fitness started to give me a little bit of national recognition that actually started to wake up the community I was already in. So then they're saying, well, he's traveling all over the country doing this. Why don't we have him here? Right. So then that's when I started getting phone calls about 2007, eight to fix a lot of the health and wellness problems that are rampant here in the Midwest. And so uh, did it just spread because these, uh, these people really needed some strength training or was it a lot of marketing and making flyers and posters and stuff like that? How did it work? A lot of it's just having results. So the first two to three years that I had my first fire department, they started to recognize as the insurance data came out that neither I or they were in charge of, they started seeing real monetary results and savings. That's when people started really waking their eyes. Can you save a department money? It's not marketing. It's not making fancy flyers. It's, right. it's none of that. It's basically saying, hey, look, I took a 130-person fire department. They are spending less than half of what they were spending on their insurance now. How do you refute that? Over the course of almost six to seven years. So it's not a 12-week study. It's not a one-year study. It's over five years. So they see the gradual drop over five years. You set that on a chief or a, a governor or a, a general's table. What can they say if they want to save money? How are they saving money? What's what's going on? Well, what's happening is is that in the old days, the fire service, the biggest problem was going into a fire. Could die, could get burned, could get smoke inhalation. Now the big killer is carrying heavier people to the, to the hospital all the time. That's the big killer. So you have, on average, below average strength people and firemen carrying above average weight people that are heavy, and which ones are going to the hospital the most? The heavier ones with diabetes, having strokes and heart attacks. So the heavyweight people are the ones that are killing us now as far as injury and insurance problems. Right. So what we do is we increase their average strength as a department. Then when they go lift a heavy person, they don't get hurt doing it. It's kind of like if me and you, if we want to deadlift 600 easily, you better pick up 800. Yeah. Right? right. Well, if their average deadlift's 400, then a 300 pound person's not heavy anymore. Therefore, they can hold together. That makes a lot of sense. So how are you achieving uh, these gains in strength? Uh, are you having them? Uh, pick up 300 pound sandbags and drag them around as if they were picking up a person or how are you doing it? Well, the first thing is developing a traction based training protocol. So we build them up with belt squats, you know, like the machine I've designed. We build them up with 45 degree back extensions. We build them up with reverse hyper extensions. We put them in a traction based environment first. Uh, what does that mean specifically traction based? Well, everything we do in life, standing, sitting, squatting, deadlifting is all compressing the spine. So if we do things that are lengthening the spine, we're reducing injury at the same time we're getting strong. So we develop a 12 to 15 week protocol to get them strong in a traction based environment and then increase the compressive forces over time. Gotcha. A over the course of two to three years, the average deadlift goes from under 200 to right at 400. Now they're strong enough to do their job, they're not broke. So most of my fire departments now are around a 400 pound deadlift in average strength, over 150 guys and girls. Once you get them out of that traction uh, period, uh, what, t what type of training are you doing with them? Got them bodybuilding? What do you got them doing? It's a mixture of everything. Like me and you have been taught ourselves to be strong. You know, how did me and you last till we were 40? By not doing the same shit all the time, right? So we mix and match. We do a bunch of different things. Uh, but mostly, I would say, a conjugate style training protocol. But the warm-up's traction-based. Then we have a compression movement. And then we have traction-based accessory exercises. So I still follow the same method in which we start. I just add in a little more compression as they're ready for it. I've never really heard uh, anybody talk about this traction-based training. A little bit from Louie back in the day talking about the uh, reverse hyper and stuff. Yeah. I've never really heard anybody say it in your terms. And this is one of the problems I have sometimes uh, with, uh, with deadlifts is um, that really heavy deadlifting can really just slow you down for lack of a better term. If we were to do a heavy deadlift session today, we'd be limping around for the next few days. Even if we're in shape for it, it's still hard to recover from. 
and it can be even hard for real high level athletes to recover from. Sounds like what you're doing keeps the people a lot fresher and keeps them uh, feeling probably just quote unquote lighter. Yeah, so when I get done training the guys at the firehouse, they're active duty. So the way we got these guys to participate is they're allowed to work out on their schedule. Like they, they're at work. They're not staying extra. Gotcha. So I have to keep these guys as strong as I can, but if they have to take a run in 10 minutes, they gotta be ready. So I only train as much as I need to get them stronger. And that's where everybody screws up. You deadlift as much as you need for your deadlift to go up and not one ounce more. You squat, you bench as much as you need, not one ounce more. That's what's kept me around. That's what's kept you around. Right. We don't overdo things. So what I do is I, their warm up and their uh, exercises that they do now would have killed them if I'd have started there. But I, I build it up over five years and now they can withstand stuff that would have killed them beforehand. That's pretty cool. And with, uh, you know, when it comes to like box squats, board presses and, and things of that nature, I've always felt that they have a, uh, even though they're great for powerlifting, obviously they've always been beneficial for powerlifting. I feel that even with the, your average person or somebody who's not going to compete, someone who really doesn't care about getting on a platform uh, to, to become a full-time powerlifter, yeah. I've always felt that those movements, uh, and even partial range of motion, deadlifts and things like that, I've always felt those movements are even more important for those type of people to, to do. What, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, my thoughts are the same as yours. It's variability. I think that if you can pull from a deficit, you can pull regular, you can pull from a pin, at a, at a higher height. The trick is, are you good at all of it? Because my firemen, my policemen, my military, they're not gonna be in the same position all the time. You know, you and I, when we're training, it's the same competition every time. The same bar, same position. With them, it's variable. They could be between a sink and a tub. They could be in a, in a valley where they can't get good footing. The trick is, are you strong everywhere? And if you have that thought pattern in your head, not only does it make you stronger overall, and in every situation, it's also less wear and tear because it's a different pressure all the time. Sometimes with certain exercises, it can be hard to even just get started in the right direction because something as simple looking as a squat can actually be quite difficult for somebody to get the right form and technique down with. Uh, how, do you, how do you get these people to learn the squat? How do you have them have like a little bit of accelerated learning when it comes to something like the squat? You just know where their weaknesses are, so you know from training a lot of people like I have, if somebody doesn't have glutes or hamstrings or low back, they're gonna squat without those muscles. Yeah. So the first eight to 10 weeks that I'm training these guys, or maybe even longer, depending on where they're starting at, I take those weaknesses and I make them stronger. And then when I teach them the squat, it takes away all the headache. If you got a guy with strong hamstrings, he's gonna use them. Right. But if he's got weak hamstrings, he's gonna hide them. And that's where technique is confused. They think, well, if you just squat with a straight bar, you'll learn the form. Actually, it degradates the form. So what you want to do is find all the weakest links, get those up to par, and then fix those areas. Right. Not just, just go in and train to train. It's having a purpose of knowing where your weak links are. Something like a belt squat I've noticed for myself, uh, you know, the big difference is when you go to do a regular squat, a regular squat is like uh, just squishing you down towards the ground. Mm -hmm. And a belt squat is more like pulling you down towards the earth. Yes. And the feeling is much different. And it seems to me like a really great place to start for someone who needs to learn how to squat. Well, very, very true because you're learning from the squat from the hip down. Then you can teach it from the hip up. So it breaks and segments the way to train that. But there's a couple other advantages. One of the other major advantages to belt squatting is if you have a shoulder problem, which is common in the fire department and the military, and if you have a back problem, which is the number one reason that we physically get out of the military. So if you were to look at injury data from physical problems in the military, 40, 50% of it's low back or mid back herniations, bulging discs, permanent injuries from jumping out of planes. Well, what if I hook the weight around their hips? They can squat again, right? So what I'm saying is, is that the bell squat gives us versatility around injuries, which are common in tactical and general fields. What's the funniest or strangest thing that's ever happened to you in the gym? No. Or, or to someone that you're working with? Well, you know, my gym I like in the ghetto. You know, you've been there. And it's getting clean. That area is, you know, getting better. But I actually saw a guy come in shit-faced, and I had my back turned to the gym. He didn't notice that there was a double monster mini on the bench bar. Took it out and about decapitated himself. <laughs> oh and I God. turned around, and he's freaking the fuck out. The bar's in here. And we have to pick it up, you know, off of him. That's, that's pretty funny. And then there was a video on my Instagram of a guy doing lap pull-downs, drunker than shit. And I'm in my office, yeah, you've seen it. A guy went viral. 
But yeah, we get. That's what I like about being in the ghetto. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> Guys, Matt Wenning. He's been a, an authority in the strength community for a long time. He's a guy that rides around the world uh, on his Harley with his grandma on the back. He's an awesome dude. Somebody I've been friends with for many, many years. Where can where can people find you? Well, I'm on Instagram at Real Matt Winning. I don't know if there's any fake ones, but Real Matt Winning, and then my community page on Facebook, and then I'm pretty easy to find through WinningStrength.com. Um, so those are all the places where I stay, and you can get get a hold of me. Matt is a world record holder, uh, both in geared powerlifting and in raw powerlifting. Uh, how old are you now? 37. At 37 years old with a good 15, 20, 20 years under your belt of lifting. 20, uh, I started when I did my first bench meet when I was 13. So, so nearly, ne yeah, about 25 years under his belt of training. Yep. He's still going at it hard. He's still somebody that can bench press over 600 pounds, easily squat over eight. What was your best squat? 865 and a belt only. And then 1197 in gear. 1,197 pounds. We'll end on that note. Strength is never a weakness. Catch you all later.